All right, Nick. Dr. Jamie Krems. The creme de la cremes. <laughs> Tell us about her. She is an associate professor at Oklahoma State University. Um, she also has a social and evolutionary psychology lab that she runs. And a lot of her research interests are on female friendship and conflict and stereotypes and prejudice. And there's so much there. Um, and it was such a great conversation that we had. I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this one. Brennan, was there anything that really stuck out to you? I think it's just she really opens your eyes to a certain set of dynamics that happen in culture and society that just don't get talked about enough. Yeah. And I think it's interesting and eye-opening, and I think people are really going to enjoy it. I think so, too. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay, thank you so much, Jamie. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, and we just like to get started by kind of asking you a little bit about how you got into this work um, and maybe a little bit of your background about things that influenced you on this path. Yeah, so um, I grew up outside Philadelphia, where Joel Embiid is going to be the MVP. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't help that. And um, the hero I, lights is known. <laughs> I mean, it's also just fact. Um, but uh, I studied Latin and archaeology. I thought I'd work in a museum um, or maybe play poker or maybe book bands. I did all sorts of weird stuff um, until I found some work by Nicole Hess that explained the world the way that I think made sense to me. Um, so it was her dissertation on informational warfare and gossip. Um, and I was actually working in music when uh, a musician gave me some books to read. And I was like, this, this is how I think other people think like this. This makes the world make sense. And it was stuff by Steven Pinker and Richard Dawkins. And finally, I had something that I loved and could sort of see the world um, in a way that yeah, just made sense to me. We all sort of have that. We joke about it in, in evolutionary social science. but we have that aha come to Jesus moment and that's it. Um, so I read those books and I knew, man, I wanna do this forever. So um, I worked in a lab at UPenn because I had no idea what I was doing. I'd studied Latin and archeology span and art history. Um, so I did biological basis of behavior, worked in a lab at UPenn, um, did a master's at Oxford in cognitive and evolutionary anthropology with Robin Dunbar and Oliver Curry, and then did uh, my doctorate in social psychology at ASU with Steve Newberg and Doug Kenrick. And now um, I have a lovely job. Having a job in academia is really nice and rare. Um, uh, so I helped co-found the Oklahoma Center for Evolutionary Analysis with Jen Bird Craven at Oklahoma State University. And it is the two of us with uh, a number of incoming scholars. Um, my primary identity, though, is as a social psychologist. So I use these evolutionary tools. Um, we do work and train students in evolutionary social science, but I'm a social psychologist and that's where I work. Okay. I have so many questions, but I'm <laughs> going to lead with the two that are piquing my curiosity the most. Tell me, just give me just the basic like thought that was going through your head at the time that you were contemplating a potential career in poker. Oh, I love money. <laughs> love it. <laughs> Um, Did you, was it a particular skill with poker that you had? Like, was there a game that you were like, I can clean people out in this? Yeah, um, my dad played blackjack for a living before I was born. Um, and he's always loved numbers. And I learned to count by counting cards um, before I was allowed to be in casinos. I was in casinos counting cards with him and playing blackjack. But um, uh, a lot of people think they're really good at poker and there's that explosion of interest in poker and it turns out they're really not. Um, so just, a lot more suckers to the table. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so especially traveling um, and online, if you know some math and aren't uh, an overconfident idiot, you can make a lot of money or at least you were able to for a while. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So now segueing back into your career in music, what was that looking like prior to all the social psychology? 
so I helped book bands at a place called the Kyber Pass, which doesn't really exist anymore, but it was famous for a while in Philly music and in punk music. People like uh, Iggy Pop and the Stooges came through there, so it was famous for that. Um, and I loved it. Musicians were really cool. Um, I used to ask them all the time if you could eliminate any band and thereby eliminate all the influence that band has had, who would you eliminate? So it was like a phylogenetic tree. If you go back in time, you're going to eliminate, say, like the first mammal, no more mammals. Hmm. Um, so it was it was interesting. Um, and uh, there is a musician that I became friends with who actually told me, hey, you are going to get so bored talking to us. Um, why don't you read these books instead? And it turned out he was right. Um, yeah. So cool. That was, it was fun. It was weird. I, I made some very happy mistakes in my youth. <laughs> yeah. It always ends up turning out that way. I think, you know, if, if your mindset's there, it's like the mistakes can always turn into like the most serendipitous moments of your life, right? Yeah, yeah, it's weird to think if I hadn't gone to Lollapalooza, hadn't seen this band LK Go play, hadn't been like, let's have this party, hadn't done any of those things, I might not be doing this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, here's to them and their treadmill video. I was going to say, absolutely, <laughs> if they didn't make that treadmill video, they wouldn't be where they, they're at maybe too. <laughs> Yes, I still, uh, it was the singer from that band who made me the list of books to, to read. And so I still have it somewhere. It's, I think it's probably in my office, which I haven't been to since COVID. So it's um, pretty cool though. Uh, I am, I'm very lucky that he was a really brilliant dude. Yeah. Yeah. Well read. That is awesome. Um, and so now I'm also curious too about just like the initial draw to like Latin and archaeology and history in general? Like, where did that kind of come from? Oh, um, <laughs> my friends would joke with archaeology that I just like pretty things, which <laughs> could entire, it could be possible. This is my weird monkey cup. Um, yeah, I just moved in, so I have no things around me, but otherwise I'm a magpie for weird stuff. Um, or bowerbird, I guess one could say. Um, and Latin, Latin's actually really similar to what we do. It's like solving a puzzle. You hold all of this stuff in your head and you have to sort of figure out the missing variable or the way things work. Um, there's something called a golden line. I remember <laughs> translating it in the Aeneid and it's, um, I think, adjective, noun, adjective, noun, verb in the middle. And it, yeah, it's a puzzle, just the way that the, the human mind or how the mind works is. So. I guess I always liked solving puzzles um, or maybe a, a more boring version is the people that studied Latin were really fun for me then. And now I love the people who study social science and I just want to hang out with them and talk nerd stuff with them all day. Have you always kind of been the type of person who's really been eager to like discover things and like, cause it kind of sounds like that's where, you know, a lot of your interests have lied, you know, like, I mean, archaeology and Latin, like you said, like you're kind of deciphering things. And has that always been a draw for you or were you kind of oh, just? So here's where I should say uh, my mother would, you know, thank you, mother, for making me very curious um, to the extent one can teach curiosity. But thank you for fostering it there. That's better. Um, yeah, I just always wanted to like poke the moss on a tree or see what, you know, was inside the seashell or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then somehow understanding these mysteries of human behavior um, became the most fun and realizing there are huge basic questions that we don't have the answers to. There's so much I don't know and so much I won't be able to accomplish even in my lifetime. So I get to train the next generation of social scientists. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, I, that resonates with me a lot because I was very, a very similar kid. But, you know, where you're the, um, you know, the utmost respected in academia, college professor, like has a nice job. I'm more of like at the level of a like a JC dropout. Like so you're like quite a few tiers above me. But yeah, like I was the type of kid who we mentioned on one of our previous podcasts. I just like wanted to see what the inside of a remote control car looked like. 
So my mom let me take it apart. And like, and then there was like a hundred pieces all over the floor that I had to clean up <laughs> and like, but like that was fine. So like fo the fostering of curiosity thing is something that I definitely like oddly tapped into. But the, the big thing for me that I probably hadn't really discovered until I went to college was that I really just learned better um, listening, like lecture based learning. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, my mom, it's funny because one of our last interviews, I was talking to my mom about it. And she was telling me that from her observation, that like, she tried to get me into like reading in books, like a lot when, she, when I was younger, like she brought home new books, like my older brother was much more into reading than I was. And I wasn't and like, it wasn't for a lack of curiosity, like it was very clear that I was curious. But like, I don't know if it was just like the things that I was curious about, like weren't going to resonate through written word to a eight year old or whatever, at that age. And then when I went to college, and like, you know, took a degree choice initially that I was just completely into, which was like kinesiology and exercise science. So I was just curious in that. So would that help me? And then like the lecture based learning and then this like evolution of like, I'm a podcast listener more than I'm a podcaster myself. So like just learning to people speak and unpack language and things of that nature is just really where my learning started to really turn to a whole new level. So yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like we've got that like link going here because I'm very much so the uh, like the ideas in and even just being friends with Nick and having more conversations with Nick, the, the topics in within the large umbrella of psychology are just endlessly fascinating and understanding like the human animal deeper is like it's so intriguing because like that's me that's that's the three of us like we are that dynamic and when you get an understanding about what's going on there, it's like, oh my God, that's so true. Like that's it. fascinating. So I, I'm really going to be interested. I know we have a few topics that we've talked about, but I'm really going to be interested to hear some of the deeper insights that you can provide on some of these topics because uh, yeah, my curiosity is uh, like a, a top that's been wound up and hasn't been let free to spin. So <laughs> that's how you guys do this, right? You just want to, yeah, that's right learn stuff yep yeah the most fun um I, people say that in academia you're learning your whole life and you never finish learning you never stop going to school or you know i'm in the 43rd grade or something but that's, <laughs> that's pretty much true um that's something i love about it you, you are always learning something different and being told you're wrong and learning how to do better and not knowing and then trying to know so yeah yeah and so i think before we get into these topics too like do you or like what kind of impact i guess do you think um your interest in maybe latin archaeology and these different topics of like music like how did they influence where you're at now doing the research that you do oh man um i mean it's fun to talk to people about that stuff um but to do the kind of stuff I wanted to do well, I had to learn so much um, about biology and evolutionary biology and anthropology and trying to understand um, the human mind the way that I want to and uh, answer the questions that I want to. So it's almost as if I sort of let that go for a really long time. Um, only recently have I come back to it because there are some fun questions in art and aesthetics um, uh, that that are neat to me that I get to answer as a social psychologist, or I get to use the tools that I've since learned to, to play with some of those questions, um, how we separate art and artist, or if we do, or if we don't. So yeah, I, I, I'm only just now going back to them and playing with them. Um, or I can, you know, sound really snooty and use some Latin and something um, that I try not to. Yeah. I, I... I appreciate that because I feel like some of my favorite theories in psychology and maybe even more broadly speaking too that I've learned about have been these theories that have drawn from so many different fields. Um, and yeah, I think it's easy for us to think about like things in very like a, with a one tracked mind of like, oh, this person maybe studied just this particular subject for so long. And it's like, well, they probably read so much about other stuff that like all contributed to this one thing. And so 
I think very similar to like our life story about like how we go through these different steps and we're here today. And it's like, there's so much knowledge and in past experiences that have influenced that, um, that, yeah, I, Brennan and I just always love hearing about how kind of people get into this work because it's always fascinating to, to hear about like the different shifts in their life that, uh, took place and the different interests they have to lead to where they are. So yeah, thank you for sharing about that. Oh, always. Yeah, it's a weird story. Um, I guess probably a lot of people have weird stories, but I don't know. Maybe some people are just in undergrad. I love philosophy in grad school. I'm going to go study philosophy and then become a philosophy professor. I, I don't know. Maybe those people, I have to meet one and see if they're interesting to them too. Do you think that, like to Nick's kind of point that he was making, do you think that stepping outside of those um, I mean, going from, you, you know, you have such an eclectic background of like interests, but you landed in this one bucket, I guess you could call it of social science. Do you think without the, you know, all of the information that's been that you've been informed by in all of these other topics, Latin, archaeology, music, poker, I mean, there's a, I mean, poker is endlessly fascinating from like a psychological and analytical perspective, like, like that's a whole topic we could get into but like do you think that really informed and like made you the social scientist that you are today or do you think that um like do you think you would have ended up here had you not had some of these same experiences i don't i don't know i um we're getting a little mad i, <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I guess i'd like to hope so um because if i if i would have come to these books and um realized, oh man, this is the way the world works and look at the costs and benefits of these weird human social behaviors. Um, I hope I would have always been fascinated by them because this life is really fun. I get to play with ideas for a living, which is ridiculous. And yes, it's a hard and yes, there's a lot of work and yes, Twitter is right. Grad school is really hard and horrible and blah, 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 but also really, really fun. And you find the people who get your jokes and your jokes are weird. So it's nice to find those people. Um, uh, okay, so I guess the short answer is I hope so. I hope yeah. I still would have found I like the optimism, yeah. Um, I mean, who knows, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so um, moving into some of the topics that you've been working on and researching in your lab, um, I guess, could you just share a little bit about what your lab kind of does research um, and some of the, the main topics? Yeah, um, most of what we do is surrounds female social psychology. So uh, female cooperation, competition, um, largely because a lot of social psychology is sort of assumed a, a male bias default and thought about men's cooperation or men's aggression as aggression. But when you push past that, you're going to make a lot of interesting discoveries, not only in the ways that women interact with other women, which is potentially distinct from how men interact with other men, but um, by looking at things that have been sort of overlooked, you're going to make some interesting discoveries that are germane to men and women, like um, some work we've done on friendship jealousy or how we might feel jealous when our friends make new friends that's relevant to men, women, anyone. Um, so most of the work is on female sociality, and then um, I have a background in prejudice and stereotyping that I also do a lot of work on, again, sometimes related to female sociality, but not always. So, yeah, I love it. Uh, women are really strategic and interesting, and I don't know if we always give them the credit that they're due there. Mm, yeah. And Tara. <laughs> yeah, I so I was hoping that we could actually jump into the friendship jealousy. I think that's super interesting. Um, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so I'm not the first person to uh, think about this. Um, people like Peter DeSholey, Rob Kurzban, um, Burkett, uh, David Buss um, have all talked about jealousy and particularly how important friendships are and that if your friend makes a new friend and you stand to sort of lose your place in the friendship hierarchy, you might feel jealous. So jealousy is distinct from envy. Envy is what we feel when somebody else has something we want. Jealousy we feel when we might lose something we have to somebody else. And so when we might lose a valued friend to somebody else, we feel jealousy and it could spur behavior that helps us 
sort of uh, prevent the threat. So we might be really nice to our friend or maybe we murder our rival, but um, yeah, depending. Um, in what I like about this kind of work is that it's sort of, um, you can play with all the inputs into the jealousy system, see the outputs or the behavior that jealousy motivates and ultimately realize that it comes out of thinking about how important friendships are to people, um, how useful they are to us, but how good they make us feel. And um, this is where I should, um, a plug for Robin Dunbar's new book on friendship, um, where he mentions that basically attracting and maintaining friends is the next best thing you could do for your health uh, to quitting smoking. So. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I'm so curious too about the evolutionary perspective on this because we get jealous because there's kind of a threat to like our relationship, right? But it mm -hmm. also seems like, is that maladaptive or is that a good is that a good signal as an emotion yeah. that we're supposed to have? That's such a great question because all of the work on jealousy um, paints it as this just solely negative emotion that is um, that leads to just bad behavior. So um, <laughs> some work suggests that it's purely Western and driven by capitalism, but we see jealousy all across culture, so it's probably not that. Um, some work says that it's, uh, you only feel jealous because there's something wrong with you. You don't, you're too immature to realize that one relationship can't fulfill all your needs. Um, and so, yeah, we see jealousy pretty negatively. And I think uh, our view of it has even influenced what researchers try to find. So they've only looked for the negative outcomes. They haven't looked for the positive outcomes, but to the extent that we see this emotion across cultures, across ages, and we see it even in non-human animals. Um, well, I should say we see behavior consistent with jealousy in non-human animals. It suggests that this emotion is probably functional. So if it were solely maladaptive, we probably wouldn't have it anymore. Um, but instead, we have it in kids, we have it in adults, we have it across cultures, we have it in non-human animals. So um, it probably helps us do something. It probably solves a problem, uh, what we'd say tributary to fitness. So we hang on to our friends and it does good things for us. Mm. Sorry, that was a kind of rambly answer just because the, the question is such a good question and people just shit on jealousy, but yeah. it's useful and it's not just a bad emotion. It feels awful, sure, but so does fear and yet fear helps us not be eaten. Yeah, I mean, based on the like descriptors that you were giving, even just in that in your very eloquent ramble that you stated there, it sounds like it would be a pretty, pretty useful driver towards reclaiming what you've lost. You know what I mean? Like evolutionarily, like if we saw somebody who, I don't know, hunted something and, you know, got to eat the tastiest part of whatever that was, and they wanted that too, the way they'd get it would be to go hunt and like do that for themselves and go achieve something for themselves. So it's almost like I, I could feel, I could see it being like a, a driver in people to like get them like a, a, as a force to action rather than just like being stagnant. Yeah. If, if somebody else is doing the kind of thing you want to be doing, um, sort of uh, envying them, you might go forth and do it. Um, or if somebody stands to take your romantic partner or your best friend, um, you might uh, engage in behavior that, whether or not it's conscious, helps you hang on to that friend and all of the good benefits of being with that friend, the health benefits of being with that friend, the psychological benefits of being with that friend. Um, I mean, if uh, it, there seems to be a little bit of a gender difference here, but if one of you started just not hanging out with the other at all and only or started a podcast with somebody else i mean <laughs> the other one would probably be a little bit jealous you, mean, and you, you want to start a podcast <laughs> <laughs> sorry nick me, <laughs> i'm worst at this you do not want me but yeah i was trying to see if we could get a reaction out of nick <laughs> <laughs> flips the table <laughs> richard dogkins and i are gonna start okay. a podcast. <laughs> i respect that that Just would be get him sleeping through everything yeah sleeping through it there we go this is so fascinating um because this brought up a memory of 
in grade school this is about like fifth grade or so um i had like a crush on this girl in my class and there was a point to where she liked me back and of course things were so great and i felt like so happy and in love pretty much of what i thought uh and then she went and liked somebody else and our connection wasn't as stable and i found myself like trying to become best friends with this other other guy <laughs> like i felt this pull i didn't even know like like consciously i feel like i knew somewhat what i was doing but i did feel this unconscious drive to like move towards him and be as close with him to try to like stay in that relationship somehow um and it was the weirdest feeling because i knew i knew that i was probably being pretty weird like like people are probably looking at me like wow like we know exactly why you're doing this because you still want to be in that relationship but at the same time i was yeah it was almost like i didn't have control over like really feeling that drive towards that so these uh these factors that are at play are so interesting yeah i mean the the general premise is that um we sort of have uh these mental mechanisms that help us uh, solve the problems our ancestors were currently faced and so you might have felt that way because you come from generations upon generations of people who when something they valued was threatened a relationship they valued was threatened they felt jealousy and did something about it and people who in the past didn't feel jealousy in those same situations and then didn't do anything about it and potentially lost their friends or partners they aren't our ancestors. They aren't the ones that made it. So it's it's neat to think that, um, yeah, even though it might feel really icky um, and we might be ashamed to even admit that, okay, yeah, I'm jealous. I was jealous of Britney Spears when she was dating Justin Timberlake or something. Um, not me personally, but one could be. Um, I would never be jealous of a couple that wore matching denim to any oh. kind of thing. Unbelievable. <laughs> It's, they're iconic but yeah it is <laughs> so uh yeah that that emotion feels awful and you might be ashamed to admit it but um it could be useful too yeah i'm, I'm thinking too about i'm still kind of like ruminating on this idea of like the utility of jealousy and even in what nick was just saying it seems like there's like a component of self-reflection that's kind of like forced upon you when you like are faced with this heavy heaviness of jealousy. And then all of a sudden you're like, you have to stop and figure out what is going on. Otherwise, like you don't know what to do, but there's like probably like a lot of, you know, personal growth that comes out of like stopping and trying to understand like, well, why did that person choose them over me or in the friendship scenario? Right? Like, well, maybe I need to be a better friend and like, you know, there, I, and then it like, kind of helps guide some of your social like decisions that you make to like okay if if the girl I like likes guys who do that maybe I need to do that and I think we probably hope that that's a positive you know action in society not like like hopefully it's like maybe I was rude and I need to stop being rude not you know biker gang dude shoot them up kind of guys and then uh I need to be a biker dude and start shooting people also we hope it's not that, but um, yeah, I'm curious if like, has there been any like, or have you done any research or do you have any insights on what the like self-reflection piece that goes along with being jealous may have as like a, as a factor for, for the whole story here? So um, I guess what I'd say to that is the, the, when you realize you're jealous, that's when you might feel ashamed. Um, but another part of it is the you could do something that is um, maybe a little bit uh, nicer to yourself, which is okay, I feel jealous, this is normal. Probably every person in the history of people has felt this, um, and what does it mean? And so when you ask yourself that, instead of saying, okay, well, I must be deficient, or um, I'm the victim of Western capitalistic values, or uh, I must have low self-esteem, or no one will ever love me, you could just say, ah, I really value this friend or this partner um, and recognize that. And that might lead to some personal growth, potentially. I mean, you could even uh, strengthen your friendship by saying, hey, you're spending all this time with somebody else. Um, I really value our friendship and it, I feel jealous and I'm embarrassed and ashamed that I feel jealous. 
So um, I think recognizing it doesn't have to be part of the behavior that jealousy can motivate, but when we recognize it, maybe we could do some potentially better stuff about it. Yeah. 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 I think that this is so important to talk about because I don't think I've ever discussed like the utility of jealousy specifically because in like you said in our culture it's such a an an emotion that's so shamed and I think that a lot of emotions get shamed but when we break them down and think about like there is probably there is definitely a reason as to why we're feeling this uh it can help us not feel so isolated or um embarrassed or guilty yeah it would be really nice to not have to feel sort of the the, those awful emotions because we recognize we're feeling an emotion that people say is icky or it feels icky. Um, Randy Nessie has some really cool stuff uh, on negative emotions. He's sort of the father of evolutionary medicine um, and runs the Center for Evolution and Medicine at ASU. Super cool dude, H Best Lifetime Award winner recently. Um, but uh, he'll talk a lot about how bad emotions aren't necessarily bad. Um, and he's done some really cool stuff in uh, sort of, I guess he'd call it Darwinian psychiatry on anxiety and, you know, the utility of anxiety. It's just in the modern world, maybe there's a bit of a mismatch. Um, but with all of these negative emotions, I mean, if they were solely maladaptive, you'd have to expect that we wouldn't have them anymore. Um, and that's clearly not the case. So, yeah, I'm curious, just this is a little more off topic, I guess, but just about your thoughts of like, why do you think this uh, idea of like forced positivity came about in our culture? Like, why did we neglect a lot of negative emotions? Nick with the heavy hitter. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if we neglected them so much as saw them as they felt negative, so they must do bad stuff. Um, and people like uh, Lita Cosmides, who um, has written on this much more clearly than I will ever be able to speak about it, um, uh, would talk about instinct blindness. I mean, we're such incredible machines in some sense that um, we don't even realize the immense cool things that we're doing. We don't even realize that fear helps us do X, Y, and Z, or jealousy helps us do X, Y, and Z. Um, and not all of these other horrible things. Um, So we might just be sort of blind to the benefits of our instincts or or that we have these instincts and they lead us to do these different uh, behaviors. So when we're not blind and we feel fear and we recognize we feel fear, we might think that it's bad or we feel sadness and we might think that, okay, so this is a negative emotion. It must be bad too, or do bad things. And then jealousy has a different history of, you know, morality and moralizing it in a way that maybe sadness doesn't, but yeah, forced positivity. That's a, I think we could talk about why people have focused on negative emotions being and doing bad more easily than why we're forced to be positive. There could be a lot of benefits from seeming positive and chipper and then, oh, good God, let's not talk about social media, but we could so yeah, right yeah no I, I that makes a lot of sense and I yeah of course there are like a ton of factors that go into that but yeah seeing that like negative emotions I sh- don't like this feeling let's not have this feeling um yeah. like let's have more of that good stuff <laughs> yes. I could totally see how that's a huge thing at play I mean I would love to be happy all the time um but like most uh, psychologists who do a lot of work. I work because I feel deficient in many ways and I'm anxious and that kind of helps me work. And I wish I didn't feel that way. I wish I could just watch the Sixers and watch Joel and be just destroy people, but I can't. Um, although, sorry, that was going to be more about the Sixers and Matisse Bible and Furkan Korkmaz and we don't need to talk about them except that they are amazing. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting how uh how you know like all good things when like certain groups or certain messages around them kind of get like overly perpetuated in society as important how it kind of like 
becomes toxic in a way. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to necessarily dip my toe into social media, but just like marketing, right? Like marketing's job is to find where the people's attention is and to just hammer them with things that they no longer want to then ruin the thing that they're on and what they're doing for their attention. Like TV would be great without commercials, but we have commercials. You would love to not have YouTube pre-roll ads. You'd love to just watch your YouTube video, but you have pre-roll ads because marketers and companies are all about money. So I'm curious too, like maybe the, you know, the forced positivity, like I'm sure there's some utility in like, you know, really, you know, acting out your life in a positive manner and trying to attract other, you know, positive like-minded people. But it's this, you know, it's when the messaging is like, if you're not positive, like there's something wrong with you, or, you know, if you, if you keep, if, if you don't have a positive outlook, then like, you know, then I, I cause I was, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about this idea that Adam Grant, you know, at uh, UPenn, one of your school you went to, um, he put out a tweet, I think it was the other day about how, um, you know, we need to stop like thinking of burnout as like some other thing as like, like separate from depression and he's like it's workplace depression that's what burnout is it so and i think that like that's so true like and we've pounded in our culture this idea of like hard work the hustle like all of this other stuff and it's like hey maybe not <laughs> like maybe like relax a little bit like enjoy the sixers like you know name your dog something that makes you smile every time you say it like you know what i mean like there's so many like little things that we can do but like people are just blinded by the hustle and yeah so I think it's um I, I hate to see when the the good things of our society just get manipulated by you know big culture and uh you know the Kardashians get a hold of it and all of a sudden it's ruined <laughs> I am um, I probably will never say anything good about the Kardashians but uh <laughs> It does go to show you that yeah, even too much of a good thing, if you fetishize it, um, that maybe it's not that great. And, and it's so hard to know what's normal. So if you try and think that the Kardashians' life is normal because you think you see their whole lives, no, right. or anybody on social media, um, yeah, it's really hard to know what's normal. And then if you're not normal or if you're okay or not, uh, it, it's a, oh God, terrifying yes yeah um i don't know if you like I don't, again i don't know where your social media kardashians like like meter is on like how much of their content you consume but i don't consume any of their content so this was news to me but um i do follow a comedian named andrew schultz and he's he's pretty funny um if you're into his type of humor i guess but um he he picked up on this instagram post that one of the kardashians did basically saying like it was like a poor me my my photo like wasn't photoshopped like yada yada like the, the image wasn't what i wanted but like this is the real me type of a photo and he completely roasted them it was like those women like the amount of self-doubt and like negative shame that oh, there's so many young women in our culture feel because of their body image stuff that they put out into the world and like whatever and the fact that she even like this it's like he compared it to the frankenstein like getting killed by your own monster like in frankenstein right it's like you created the beast that is like all of this anxiety depression around like body issues and whatever because like they do photoshop their photos they get un un natural plastic surgery and they create these like images of themselves and he just completely roasted them but i'm like it's so true like we're living in a world where you know like it's just it's just so crazy how much this like really like gets into society and people's heads and and like how as much as we want to like point the finger and blame them like they still got 30 40 50 100 million followers on instagram Man, it's tough. I don't know where I was going with that. I really just went out on a rant, but man. I mean, how about it? They they really do have a lot of influence. I don't, I honestly don't know very much about them, but um I wish I knew less. I guess I'm I'm always wary of people who tell you what to do. Like, I want to know how the mind works. Mm -hmm. I I want to know what to think. I want to know what other people think, what their stereotypes are, or what drive their stereotypes, maybe, you know, how to combat those stereotypes at times. Um, but 
uh, like even in, um, we have a, a recent paper coming out in psych science on um, uh, Americans hold the stereotype that women, but not men who have casual sex have low self-esteem and all sorts of negative knock-on effects from the stereotype are possible. We sort of detail the stereotype um, and people have been asking me, so what advice do you have for young women? That, I mean, that's just not. That's not, that's thinking about the, that's not the root cause of this problem, right? Like that's thinking of the wrong thing to find an answer for. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is. And at the same time, uh, for me, what the data tell me is that maybe some of the even well-meaning advice for young women um, might constrain their behavior. And um, I don't, I don't know what any individual should do. I, I got data on this thing. <laughs> I can tell you how this thing works. Um, I could tell you what drives it and what doesn't and who holds it and who doesn't. And but I, I'm not going to tell you what to do. That's neither my place nor do I have any expertise in it. Um, so I'm I'm always a little wary of uh, yeah people telling um, other people what to do. But um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a weirdo. That's also entirely possible. No, no, no I think that's completely valid because, like you both were saying, I feel like giving advice in as a solution to a problem that's existing is kind of just creating a cycle of you're going to need to use that advice again instead of like what Brennan was saying as to like instead of tackling what the problem is right yeah, you could change the culture perhaps and or you could ask where it comes from why is it why is the stereotype prevalent is it prevalent across cultures I mean there are so many questions I don't know how to get to an answer. And I certainly would never presume that I know more about a person's life than they do. And yeah. yeah. So yeah, nor do most of the work that we do. I mean, it's on people writ large. It's not on individuals. I'm not, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I will leave that to my colleagues who know what to do and how to give advice or you're in counseling. You can, you tell them what to do. I'm just gonna, just gonna write this paper. <laughs> right but yeah it's similar exactly. it's like i feel like it's very a lot of what i've learned is a lot of what you're talking about too in my clinical work is that like we claim psychologists to be like experts on like people and like giving advice but it's very much the opposite of you're just like reflectively listening and like the person is the expert on their own life um like they they know what they need to do uh, you just need to kind of support them in doing that. Um, yeah, this whole piece of advice is, it, it's helpful, of course, at times, but right, it's like people have their own kind of paths and their own ways of doing things. Um, but so, so yeah, I'm, I was also curious about like more specific details, I guess, of the research of like, how do you, so there's perceived self-esteem, self -esteem, right? Like, what are the factors that go into that oh so this stuff was all um basically uh given very little information about a target um the target's gender so is the target a man a woman or you don't know um and given the target sexual behavior in this case so uh, committed sexual behavior um so having sex with one person at a time and only when you're in a committed relationship versus more uncommitted sexual behavior, casual sex, and one night stands. Um, so you have some kind of information about the target. Based only on this little information, uh, what is your inference that about the target's self-esteem or their feelings of their own self-worth, I think is how we defined it for participants. Um, and we measured it in a couple of different ways, but essentially um, people associated uh, when women having casual sex with low self-esteem. And what's interesting to me about that is that um, even when we told people like, no, this is exactly what the woman wants to be doing. She could have more committed relationships, but she wants to have casual sex and she's happy. Um, this association really didn't go away. Um, so yeah, it's a, it was, 
a series of studies that was really informative and uh, maybe a little unfortunate, the, the results, but hopefully interesting and hopefully we could do something about it. Yeah. Do you, do you have uh, like initial thoughts about maybe some of the reasons why um, these things might come up like this? Yeah. So um, there are a bunch of possibilities that we could consider. Um, one is that maybe people think that casual sex is bad. And so anybody who is having casual sex is um, going to be thought of negatively. Um, and our data suggests that that probably isn't true because they didn't think that men who had casual sex were having low self-esteem. They also didn't think that women who had casual sex were less physically attractive. So you would have expected if it were sort of like a reverse halo effect account, they should have found women who are having casual sex to be less attractive too, and they didn't. Um, and the next sort of intuitive question uh, that one might ask is, well, is it just driven by like religious teachings, say, or conservative teachings? Um, but we still found these same effects, even when we controlled for uh, religiosity, conservatism, sexism, people's own sexual behavior. So it wasn't driven by that. Um, so those are things you might think are causing it and probably aren't. Um, what might be the case is that, uh, oh, and then, so there's work uh, from folks like Lee Jessam on stereotype accuracy, and um, I'm hoping I don't mischaracterize this, but in short, um, uh, the notion is that stereotypes sort of reflect a very exaggerated reality. Um, but our own data suggests as well that that's also probably not the case here. Um, so the very same participants who held the stereotype uh, we measured their self-esteem and their sexual behavior, and there wasn't a link. Um, so they think that there's a link in other people. Women have low self-esteem. Women who have casual sex have low self-esteem. Participants, including female participants who have casual sex, don't have low self-esteem. So the stereotype seems unfounded. Um, and this is in line with a lot of work that um, Dave Schmidt has done, where he's found uh, no real strong links between people's casual sexual behavior and their self-esteem. So it's probably not reflecting reality. Um, so we, we sort of go through a bunch of possibilities, just like you're saying, why is this happening? Um, it's probably not any of those. Um, best guess, in all honesty, is that maybe... Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know how much stock to put in this, but maybe um, our minds have sort of not caught up with the long history of different costs and benefits of casual sex in men and women. So on average, men could potentially benefit a lot more than women could from having short term sex. Um, women might face a lot of uh, face more costs than men from having short term sex. So one of the biggest real world sex differences we see is in desire for short term sex. Um, so maybe uh, our minds sort of still hold that as the default, even though reproductive technologies and safe access to safe and legal abortion have meant that women can enjoy casual sex without those costs. Sorry, did I just go way too no. nerd? Okay. No, 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 that was, that was great. great. So we, yeah, there are just so many possibilities and um, I am in no way ashamed of saying, I don't know what the answer is, but there are some options. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was a great response that was very nuanced. Um, but I, yeah, I was curious about like maybe the evolutionary perspective about that as well. And then the different factors that are in our society today that could be at play too. So I thought that that was a very informative. I've, I've also heard a theory. I don't know that it was put into this context. So, and I'll do my best to get as much of the detail out of this as I can, but um, the idea that back when, you know, civilizations were very tribal and there was a, um, you know, small groups of people that, you know, we're living like hunting, gathering that type of timeline. Um, there was a, like a utility to having multiple partners because then, uh, the paternity of the child would not be identified and it would just be kind of absorbed into the community as like 
like a, just a member so that by not being able to identify the father, it was actually more protective of the tribe because when you did like, you know, tried to like force the monogamous in that time, it started to drive divides between people um, in tribes and sec separate tribes would start to break out because of disagreements over, um, you know, as a father, you'd want to be providing for those people, like those, just those people. And you'd potentially steal from the rest of the tribe and like, just to pr protect your own family group. So by not knowing, and so maybe there's some kind of like internal, um, you know, framework going there that is very naturally just human for like certain people to, you know, have this tendency of like casual sex being just totally normal and part of their, um, you know, the way that they, they think about sex because they, in, in our uh, genetics, it's kind of like there was a protective element to it. So um, there's a, there's a bunch of cool stuff in there um, uh, that we should, oh God, unpack. I'm sorry. I'm one of Do those it. Let's unpack. Um, <laughs> but uh, first I should say, so um, there's probably, I would doubt that anything is going on that is for the good of the species, but rather for the good of the individual. Okay. Um, so, or you could say good to the group, good to the species, but, um, so at the individual level, um, there's probably a lot going on. And one of the things that we should start with is the idea that, um, when a woman has a child, she knows it's her child. And when a man has a child, he is less certain necessarily, uh, compared to the woman. So this idea of paternity uncertainty is really interesting and women could potentially confuse paternity um, and if they do, it's possible that uh, women and their offspring could benefit from that in multiple ways. So some of the benefits to women of having multiple partners would be um, uh, potentially getting more resources and resources are really important um, for having healthy surviving offspring. Uh, lactation is massively calorically expensive. So that's a possibility. Um, another possibility, like you said, sort of um, confusing paternity could be protective. So um, infanticide is not uncommon. And uh, I might, if I were uh, a male coming into the group, maybe I want to get rid of uh, a woman's offspring and um, have a relationship with her, say. So confusing paternity could potentially help the kid, the mother and the kid get resources. It could be protective for the mother and the child potentially as well. So there are definitely benefits that women can enjoy from casual sex or short-term sex or however we wanna characterize it here, which is pretty interesting. Um, and a lot of work has sort of uh, ignored the possible benefits that women get. Um, People like David Buss and Dave Schmidt have looked at that. They have an incredible paper on sexual strategies. Um, uh, Jane Lancaster, sort of a grand dame of evolutionary anthropology, who is an amazingly kind person as well, um, has really neat work in Dominica, um, looking at the benefits of casual sex for women and their access to resources in a place that is really resource scarce. Um, and what's really nice about a lot of this work is that none of it is moralizing the casual sex. But of course, when we talk about it, we have to realize that other people might potentially do that, um, whether or not we mean to, and hopefully we aren't. Um, so anyway, uh, didn't mean to add on that meta point, but. No, that was great. Cause I definitely didn't, you know, summarize that as eloquently as you did. So I think that you added quite a good clarity and value to what I was mm -hmm. trying to articulate. Yeah. No, 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 you articulated. I, I very much take the Terry Jones uh, from Monty Python path of nobody's really cleverer than anybody else. It's just saying this stuff out loud. And I have a ton of practice at it because I do it for a living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to now about just how, like what drew you to maybe female cooperation as a research interest? Um, so, I mean, I think it's fascinating um, the ways that women cooperate and compete, um, including in ways that, and I mean, absolutely no offense to you gents, um, but you might never notice. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine, um, in fact, I know it's true that I've had uh, relationships with 
guys where I'd say, did you notice that slight or that look or that thing? And they mm. no idea what happened. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think uh, it is fascinating um, and really strategic the way that women actively create and compete and um, make these environments and that um, you know, women also strategically navigate these environments. And part of the reason I study it is because I am a woman and I think it's fascinating. Um, part of the reason is because it's overlooked and there are a lot of open questions, I mean, basic open questions that we should be looking at. Um, so Jen Bird Craven, um, who's a professor at Oklahoma State University and the other co-founder of Ocean with me is amazing and uh, she does work on the psychobiology of female friendships um, she's about to write this commentary um, talking about some of the basic questions that we need to answer such as uh, just describing women's friendships during pregnancy and in later life like what do they look like are they robust are they not uh, it couldn't be <laughs> more basic than that so yeah it's neat I'm a woman, there are open questions. Um, and there's, there's some real value there because a lot of the behavior that women engage in, men engage in as well, um, but maybe we haven't looked at it because it's just not as overt. So if we think about female aggression um, being more covert, for example, or quote unquote indirect, um, for a long time, we didn't realize that females aggressed at all. Um, we thought, no, they don't do that. Guys do it. Women, women don't do it. But in part, just because we didn't observe women hitting each other. And then when we realized, anyway, I can talk about that forever. But it's neat. It's neat to me. And um, the, other, the other response, the other honest answer to why I study it is because um, I've had incredible female cooperators in my life, female mentors, female friends, um, so uh, one of my female friends and cooperators and collaborators is Keila Williams, JD, PhD, former lab mate. So academic sister who's at Hamilton College right now and does incredible research also on friendship, but on um, ecology and race and stereotyping. Um, and these people sort of, the female friendships got me through my life at grad school. They also were <laughs> the worst. I mean, like the most painful experiences have come from not, you know, romance or anything like that, but also from female friends. And this is one place where I'm pretty sure I'm not weird. Um, every woman I talk to about my research has a similar story about the woman that made her life possible and all of this amazing, just the zenith of friendship and then how another woman just ruined her life at one point in time. So um, I've had great cooperators and uh, two women hurt me more than I could ever imagine. And so I needed to know why. And here I am. Yeah. That is so interesting. As you shared that, I reflected on like the women in my life and I don't want to speak for them, but like my perspective or perception of their experiences is very similar in that like there were some extremely damaging relationships and friendships with um, other women and then also there's been people that they have like really connected with and looked up to and has have been mentors in their lives but yeah those those hardships were like harder than any relationship that I could ever imagine me having um, and they like those effects lasted for a while. And it, yeah, it wasn't just like, this happened, we're kind of done. It was, <laughs> it, it extended for like months, those years. Those cuts are deep. Yeah, yes. um, it's, yes. that's so fascinating. It's, um, I mean, uh, I think it was 23, 24, somewhere around there. I don't even remember. And I, it is still painful for me to look back on the uh, two hour, 26 page, if you took the Gchat conversation from Gchat and pasted it into Word, Gchat conversation that my then housemate had with my best friend of 20 years about how much they hated me. And you just, wait, you want my mother to die so that I am alone? How, I, I, 
I paid for your plane ticket. Like I've done this for you. We've known each other our whole lives. How could you feel this way? And like to have no idea just messes with your perception of the world. But I, I'm loath to say this at the same time. Uh, what's really beautiful about this aggression is how effective it is. And if the idiot hadn't had that G chat on my computer, I mean, come on. Um, I would have never known she would have uh, ruined or at least weakened my most important social relationship at the time, my best friendship, without me ever knowing it happened. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, uh, this kind of aggression is beautifully strategic, but also Emily and Mia, I hate you and I hope you're unhappy. <laughs> well, I've heard somebody recently talk about that comparison and I, I'm curious if you think that it's um you know if it holds true based on the research that you've done but somebody was comparing the way that and this may have been strictly to on social media mm -hmm. where it's like um the difference between like a male online aggression and a female online aggression would be like a guy just wants to like expose you for being like you know, weak or whatever, like, and they're just, they're just going to call you out kind of a thing. Whereas like, like a, the female aggression is typically geared towards like completely dis dismantling your reputation and hoping you have no followers, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I, I mean, there's so much there. There is. So first there's the content, right? The kinds of things that um, are gonna harm women's reputation are a little bit, are often a lot of overlap, but there are some differences too. So if I say that, um, an, uh, if I'm a guy saying another guy is a weakling, I am hitting him where it hurts. Whereas if I say another woman is sexually promiscuous, maybe I'm hitting her where it hurts. Um, whereas it wouldn't be the same if you sort of switched it. Right. Um, and then there's the tactic. So there's the content that we gossip about um, or share, spread. And then there's the way that we do it. Um, a lot of the theorizing about uh, female typical indirect aggression, which it turns out males do just as much, um, maybe a little bit less intrasexually than women do, but males do this too. Um, uh, the theorizing sort of pivots on this assumption, which um, actually I've just tested, and this is what I'm presenting in, in a lab soon, but this largely untested assumption that indirect aggression um, protects the aggressor from being retaliated against. Uh, largely, they mean by the target. So if you don't know you've been gossiped about, you can't get me back. Um, and a lot of female typical aggression again, quote unquote, female typical seems to be um, more subtle, more covert. Um, and it does tend to hit uh, same sex targets in their social relationships, which are so important. I and mean, women really, really value best friendships and they have dyadic best friendships. Um, and these best friendships are often uh, shorter lived than male sort of group based friendships. So they're more vulnerable to dissolution, they're easier to harm. And man, again, this is a place where women's aggression is horribly strategic and effective. It's high bang for low buck. Um, and I could talk about this for way too long, I'm sorry. But yes, exactly that, <laughs> what well, you said. I, I was kind of curious too, cause you, you kind of alluded to it before, but would you be able to give us a little more insight maybe on the differences in behaviors just in general between um, men and men with men and female with female friendship groups? Because we kind of talked about it, but um, yeah, I think it'll give some additional insight in this conversation too. Oh yeah, so um, there are uh, some pretty interesting and largely cross-cultural differences when we talk about um, male-male friendships or multi-male friendships and female-female friendships. So. Females tend to form one-on-one uh, -on -one best friendships. Uh, males tend to form multi-male friendship groups. Um, females' dyadic best friendships are really deep. They're characterized by high self-disclosure, emotional involvement, a lot of self-talk and problem talk and evaluative talk about other people who aren't there. Um, males, less so. 
They're more, um, people have called them shoulder to shoulder friendships. Males do activities together, whereas females have these face to face dyadic friendships. They're talking about everything, which can be a lot of ammo if that relationship dissolves. Um, and we do tend to see that females' uh, best friendships seem to be shorter lived than males' best friendships. Um, and even during the sort of same length, there are more um, sort of insults to the female-female friendship or issues that perturb the female-female friendship in the same amount of time as the males. Um, so although females are sort of characterized or stereotyped to be more uh, nurturing and tolerant, what we tend to see in friendships at least is that males are more tolerant of genetically unrelated males than females are of genetically unrelated females. Um, and Joyce Benenson is the alpha and omega in a lot of this work. She is incredible. Um, Anne Campbell has done incredible work here as well. Um, what Joyce Benenson's work would suggest, um, so there's really cool work in, in sports, for example where after a game, you see that males are even touching each other more than females are. Um, so there's more sort of reconciliation, bids, tolerance. Um, yeah, there, there are these remarkable differences that, again, they seem to be cross-cultural, they seem to happen early in life and be sustained, but a lot of the basic research we need to do isn't done. We need to know if this is the case throughout life. We need to know if this is the case across cultures. And yeah, we don't. I was gonna I was gonna ask that. Like, it, does the the stage of the life cycle affect the way that these dynamics are like at play? Um, I'd be interested. Like, you know, for example, like a twelve year old in middle like in middle school class navigating friendships versus a mother's group or whatever it may be. Right? Like, I feel like the dynamic is very. I mean, similar. But there's some differences there too, and I I'd be curious if the if all of those things stay consistent or if there's like a a shift at any point. Yeah, I mean, man, you're not alone in that you'd be curious. <laughs> um, so people like Joyce Benenson um, have uh, sorry, I should say Joyce Benenson has looked a lot at the sort of early life. Um, Tracy Vian Cole, who is an amazing woman. Oh man, she is badass. She could beat me up and at the same time coach soccer and write a paper. Um, she, uh, so she's done a lot of work on female aggression and sociality in development and bullying. Um, but a lot of our work sort of stops um, in early life. And part of that is because it's just easier to get subjects into the lab who are in their 20s because they're in college and they're trapped. They have to work with us. Um, looking specifically at mothers is a little bit more difficult. People like Marianne Fisher are uh, really interested in that and have been doing some of that work. Um, but we don't, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, we just don't know. And then in later life, we don't know. Um, again, part of it is just convenience. It's easier to get college samples. It's easier to think about mating competition than mom petition. Um, but you might imagine that the things that um, mothers compete over are pretty useful to their offspring success and longevity. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to know too, but yeah. <laughs> we need more. Uh, uh, Daniel Sneezer, one of my favorite scientists and probably um, the person responsible for making me a better scientist uh, recently. Um, he's a, a psychologist at the University of Montreal and studies shame and pride. Unbelievable, um, unbelievable uh, experimentalist. Um, he would say more funding is needed. So yeah, if anyone's listening to this that has a bunch of money that wants to actually know what goes on in women's lives, please give it to us so that we can do the work, the basic science. Um, and then here's where I should say like some obvious comment about how, of course, once women are no longer of sexually desirable, they become mothers and older, of course, we ignore them. What is some of the, I mean, of course, this is like a, a large question that I know is still being researched constantly. Um, but like, what are some of the reasons as to why like women prefer one-on-one -on -one relationships and men with the multi-group 
I mean, that's a great question. Um, I feel so bad that I keep saying, you know, we don't know, or I don't know. Um, one reason seems to um, be that uh, there are some potential benefits of male sort of coalitional or multi-male friendships for males, um, including, um, so we see this in non-human primates, in, in some non-human primates, and we see it in humans as well, um, that the idea is, uh, given the long history of intergroup warfare, having a multi-male group was potentially useful. Um, so yes, it protected the group, but it made it more likely that you and your offspring would survive, you'd band together, you'd get the benefits of um, uh, basically all of the goodies and resources that you could only get when you would cooperate in a large group. And there were pressures for males to cooperate to say, get big game or um, beat other groups in ways that there might not have been for females. Um, so, I mean, I love the, the mythology of the Amazons and all of that and the, you know, the fancy breastplates and whatnot and amazing warriors and Xena warrior princess. I even love that. Lucy Wallace was amazing. But there really isn't great archaeological evidence of, uh, you know, large groups of females banding together in the way that we see males having done. So, yeah, it, it seems like there the pressures for males to band together were greater, and maybe females didn't face those same pressures. So, um, it doesn't tell us why females prefer one-on-one -on -one relationships, but it does start to tell us why males might have formed multi-male relationships. So I can kind of answer what some people think is an answer to part of that question. And uh, this is why academia is so incremental. <laughs> Could there be a connection with the idea of like um, the benefit of like having a female mentor as a female and like that really playing into that idea of a one-to-one -one relationship um, and like guy, like, seeking guidance in that way like whether it's mother daughter or just like you know elder female younger female like do we like as maybe even like um archaeologically or ancestrally or whatever do we have any like reason to believe that maybe that relationship is like really crucial for the development of women as they are, like benefit from the one-to-one -one? Um, I, d I don't know if I might I be reaching. Um, I mean, uh, when females can maintain relationships with kin, um, it's really important and really useful. Uh, kin are invested in your welfare in a way that other people aren't necessarily. Um, so uh, having kin around is really useful. Having those relationships is useful. Um, I mean, there's some theorizing uh, on this that uh, so women form really close relationships to, uh, at least in non-human primates, um, fend off male aggressors. That's a possibility, although it doesn't necessarily um, say uh, why it would be female, female, but maybe if they're just so close, if they're dyadic and they're so close, you know, time is inelastic and they have to be. Another uh, Another theory is that um, it, it sort of co-ops the mother-infant bond. And so often mother, one infant, these relationships co-op those bonds. That's a possibility. Um, uh, I think there are some ideas out there. Um, I don't know if any of them are right. There's also, I mean, the, the possibility that um, I think Joyce Benenson raises this uh, in her 2014 book, Warriors and Warriors. I might have gotten that mixed up, but um, the females' really close relationships aren't that beneficial to other females, and they're net they're net loss. Um, so she would suggest that. Uh, I mean, to the extent that. Um, friendships are really uh, protective for health. And uh, Joan Silk has done incredible work in non-human primates um, in baboon showing that a few close female friendships uh, increases the survivability of offspring. It's possible. 
um, that these, maybe Joyce Benenson's wrong, maybe uh, what Joan Silk is doing doesn't apply to humans. This is a place where, yeah, not surprisingly, I'm about to say again, no, we don't know. We just don't know. It's a mystery. Yeah. Everybody talks about this, you know, veil over female behavior, but part of the veil is just, we haven't looked yet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I kind of wanted, uh, oh, I want yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I, I just, uh, I was apologizing for the fact that, you know, it, it's boring to say over and over again, it could be this, it could be that, but we don't know because we haven't looked, which is, that's what you should name this episode. <laughs> <laughs> We have a so let this be an official call to those with the deep pockets once again <laughs> pony pony up there's a lot to be done <laughs> yes yeah yeah but no I, I mean we appreciate those these complex responses because we know that like if there was one answer like if, if you gave us one specific answer we'd be like <laughs> we'd probably test that and be like i don't that doesn't sound right completely you know yeah i mean Oh man, these are big questions too. Um, uh, I think maybe um, biting off different pieces of the question is helpful, but good Lord, this is um, uh, probably a generation's worth of work to be done here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the indirect aggression because I think that's a really interesting topic. And I think how you shifted the perspective a little bit to, seeing how it can be beautifully strategic is so fascinating too because I never took that perspective um I was hoping just could you share a little bit about that uh like what does it look like or maybe the utility of it as well and then maybe we can get into like what cyberbullying and social media has done too because I could just see how this is really taking this to a next level yeah, uh, so indirect aggression, um, there are different terms here. So there's relational aggression, hitting people in their relationships. There's social aggression, um, using, uh, using other people to harm relationships. Um, in general, uh, like most people in this literature, I just say indirect aggression, meaning sort of covert types of aggression like gossip like social exclusion, which some people might not consider to actually be indirect because it can be done directly. Um, the, the terminology is messy, but think about gossip. That's sort of the easiest thing to get a handle on. Um, and you can contrast it with a sort of over direct physical aggression, face-to-face -face yelling, pushing, shoving. And with direct aggression, so if I hit you in the face, you would see me coming, you would know that you got hit, and you would know who hit you, typically. With indirect aggression, um, the notion is that uh, I could essentially hit you, though not physically, I could hit you in the relationship or in the reputation um, via words behind your back. So you wouldn't necessarily know that somebody was gossiping about you. Um, even if you did, you might not know who started that gossip. Um, but it could be really effective because that gossip could ruin your social relationships, your reputation, your access to resources. And all the while I'm over here and you have no idea I'm the one that did it. So you're not going to be able to retaliate against me. You don't even know who I am. Um, and that is kind of the beauty of indirect aggression is that it can be highly effective, um, even while being fairly low cost. So this is just a thought that came up too. Do you think that there is any reason to believe that like evolutionarily, like with the biological, like physical differences of um, like men being maybe more, like being able to aggress more physically, like in a more powerful way, like is that why maybe like female interactions kind of develop to be more indirect and in turn, like what like you're saying, so much more effective too. So yeah, there are some really big questions in here, which is, um, and I should say Nicole Hess has done uh, some incredible, like the heavy lifting here, Nicole Hess, uh, Hess and Hagen, um, Ed Hagen, uh, Ann Campbell, uh, Bjorkvist, um, 
to give credit where credit is due. Uh, so the one of the questions is why did indirect aggression evolve? Um, another question is uh, why do females maybe do that more than males do? If they do, it seems like it's pretty close that males do it um, as much, maybe, maybe a little bit less. Um, I mean, certainly females prefer indirect aggression to direct aggression, overwhelmingly so, when um, aggressing against other females is what Tracy Bianco would say. Um, and a related question is why do females avoid physical aggression? So, um, I mean, the, the idea is um, females might avoid physical aggression because uh, it's really costly. Um, so females can pretty easily become mothers, uh, female, females who are mothers, um, are integral to their survival of their offspring. So physical aggression is just too costly for females. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, and I should say too, um, uh, a lot of this is thinking about intrasexual aggression. So if two females are fighting each other, there isn't the same asymmetry in physical formidability as a female fighting a male. Um, and we, we often sort of forget that uh, when we're talking about this kind of like, oh, well, it's because females are less physically formidable, they had to do this, but uh, it's, it's possible um, that females would avoid physical aggression for that reason. Um, but it's possible too, uh, by that same token that uh, less physically formidable males might engage in indirect aggression as well. Um, and to the extent that it's effective, and by effective, I mean like high impact and low cost, then we should expect both males and females to engage in it. And unsurprisingly, um, when language comes online, man, they really do. They really do. Um, if females are maybe a little better at it um, from practice, from necessity, because there are more sanctions against females from aggressing directly or overtly, uh, for reasons related to sort of social intelligence, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry again. Yeah. Oh, that you was, know, I, was good. Yeah. And I'm kind of just thinking about it too. Like Nick was talking, what's like, what would the utility of these different types of aggression be? And we were talking about before, um, with men, how they kind of naturally form friend groups and things of that nature. And I feel like, you know, to try and take a, evolutionary approach to it like a hunting party would go out and you know the um indirect aggression would be very impractical in a hunting party to then like start severing trust and ties between people i mean this is just my like thought process coming out in in words here but like you know if, if you had a bunch of people you didn't trust or you couldn't squash your beef let's say um hunting pun um if you couldn't if you couldn't do that then you would potentially have somebody in that hunting party who would not have your back and that could lead to you getting killed by a predator or whatever it may be um so there may have been more utility and just like yeah fight it out and get it figured out because like when we go out tomorrow we got to have each other's backs otherwise we're not going to eat and i'm just thinking like potential utility for the other side could be um, you know, like you, you kind of alluded to it, but climbing the social hierarchy and having protection within the tribe. So like, if you could ostracize somebody, you could potentially put yourself up on the, I'm going to get food, I'm going to get resources, I'm going to get all this other stuff that I need to protect my child. So I, I feel like, yeah, like there is some real utility in, you know, utilizing your, your strengths in in that like tribal setting i guess to like how to climb that social ladder because men i think you know it was kind of like bringing the resources in and for the women of the tribe it was it was definitely con contribution at the tribe itself but also you know if you could just like if you could just work the social game of the tribe too you could bump yourself up significantly so yeah i mean there there seemed to be sort of um whether because of the ecology, a physical or social sort of different um, opportunities for men and women. Right, so yeah. men might band together to, you know, defend the group or um, hunt big game, say, 
Um, not that women didn't also band together and um, help do all sorts of things, but there might be sort of a, um, a greater zero sumness within some of women's social relationships. So if you think about co-wives, for example, um, what uh, the resources that my co-wife gets uh, are not gonna be available to me and vice versa. So if I can um, sever her social relationship or harm her reputation so that somebody thinks of me first, I might gain any benefits that she loses. Mm -hmm. uh, where there are sort of, uh, uh, there might be, so Nicole Hess sort of uh, describes this in Hessenhagen as within group aggression. So between groups, maybe you just fight it out hand to hand, fist to fist. Um, but within groups, maybe there is a benefit of harming somebody's reputation without eliminating them. So you still have the numbers, but you also, um, by putting them down uh, or their reputation as say a cooperator down, you climb up a rung, mm -hmm. uh, which could be useful for both males and females, which is um, probably, I mean, this seems to be closer to the right answer than some of the other stuff that is premised on sex differences since females do avoid direct aggression, but males also engage in indirect aggression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I think, I'm curious, and you said earlier about the influence of social media and like, of course, that we could probably talk for days on end about that. But um, I guess, yeah, I'm curious about some of your initial thoughts of how indirect has been in, or indirect aggression has been influenced by um, the utility of social media. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the potential hallmarks or, um, of indirect aggression is that, again, it lets the aggressor avoid retaliation um, in part because the aggressor is removed from the act. So I'm not hitting you face to face. I'm saying awful things behind your back. Um, and in doing so, it might allow me to be anonymous. And that anonymity is a hallmark of the online space. Um, so you might have no idea that I you know, purposefully didn't like your photo or that I'm uh, baby Yoda 21 who's saying really awful stuff underneath your picture. Um, I have, that's not my name on any <laughs> For real, it isn't. Uh, if baby Yoda 21's like a really nice guy or gal, you know, this is not meant to represent <laughs> baby Yoda's out there. Very sorry, baby Yoda. Um, uh, like a Tesla there, he's <laughs> my feet. That's one of my dogs. He looks like the luck dragon from never ending story. Um, so yeah, the, the potential for anonymity means that the costs of aggression, uh, are way down, which should, I mean, you'd expect there to be more aggression if you could be anonymous and not suffer the costs as long as you're still hitting your target, presumably. Oh man. Yeah. So what are some of your thoughts about that? Like not having to experience the results of some of these actions, like, is that, do you think that's causing a lot of negative um, things? <laughs> I mean, it, it absolutely might be. Um, we probably haven't even really plumbed the depths of all of the, the sort of possibility space of acts of aggression online because it is entirely possible that withholding a like or a thumbs up or something could be considered an act of aggression. Um, but to the extent that we see, um, uh, so Tracy Vianco has a really great paper in Proc B in 2013, where she discusses um, how particularly among young women, um, being the experiencing acts of indirect aggression can lead to uh, depression, anxiety, and heightened suicidality. Um, so, I mean, these things are effective. And if I can go online and harm my enemy without anybody knowing it's me, um, I'm gonna be more likely to do it because I'm not gonna get hurt. I'm not gonna get caught. Um, and yet at the same time, I mean, we, we realize that people are truly taking their own lives because of online bullying. So 
um, it clearly is a problem. I don't know if anyone successfully uh, solved the problem or even really outlined the problem. Um, I should say describe the problem, but it, we know it's happening. We know it, it can come at huge cost. I don't know if we know how to stop it. But again, that's not my area. I would, I would ask Tracy Vianco. It would, it would seem to me that maybe one of the bigger issues, and this is, again, this whole podcast is me just thinking out loud. So <laughs> feel free to just shut down Same. my ideas if, uh, if, if I'm going way off the deep end here. But it would seem like with everything we've talked about before, like the idea of like experiencing these um, indirect aggressions isn't new by any means, but maybe just the volume and the scale at which we experience them is just like unfathomable. Because like you said, like you could post one picture, you have 300 followers, let's say, and you only get like 10 likes, like you didn't have 290 people, you know, indirectly aggressing you, but it may feel that way. And then, you know, you don't get enough, you don't get the comments you want, or you get a bad comment, or, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that somebody can anonymously try and attack your reputation that it may feel like unmanageable. I, I could only imagine I am, you know, fortunately I set myself up to like, not really, you know, subject myself to a whole ton of like the online presence aside from like what goes on with the podcast and stuff. But man, like, I mean, I can totally imagine, especially when you're trying to navigate like just typical social interaction as a young person and then you're mixing in, you know, like a overwhelm, a tsunami of indirect aggressions at you every day from online bullying of other kids of what did or didn't happen. Man, I just, I couldn't imagine like the emotional toll that would take on somebody, especially as they're developing. It's, a, it's just a weird, uh, or maybe we should say novel social ecology where you can encounter all of these people more than probably we've ever would have encountered in our lifetimes. So we could potentially right. encounter, encounter in a day. Um, and yet these encounters are largely anonymized. Um, so the costs and benefits of a lot of different social acts are just not what they would have been through most of our um, uh, human history. So it's a it's a weird and novel space in a lot of ways, yeah. um, and I don't know if we really understand all of the costs and benefits. I mean, certainly we thought connecting people is going to be the best thing ever, all benefits, and then um, you know, incels and the Capitol riot and all right. of these other things. Is so. is that Dunbar's number that says that your brain only has the capacity to really remember like 150 people? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Robin Dunbar, who's a professor now in experimental psychology at Oxford and at Maudlin College, and um, full disclosure, former mentor, uh, incredible dude, um, he uh, extrapolated this number based on the social, um, social group sizes of different primates. Um, and we see this number instantiated in um, like Hutterite groups and um, it's reflected in military uh, groupings, it's reflected in ancient settlements and it's possible that's coincidence. There's some pushback on that number right now. Um, it's possible that that reflects something uh, deeper, sort of like um, <laughs> the way that we see fractals in veins and leaf veins and rivers and mountains and it, it's possible that there's some sort of math of the universe in it it's possible that it's not um but yes in any case that's Dunbar's number 150 the number of people that you would feel comfortable sort of uh sitting down to say hi to for a while if you saw them out and they were having coffee um yeah it's an interesting concept too when we think about like this you know what could potentially be like a complete dismantling of that through social media of like, you know, a million people, like there's just like your capacity to process that like we just may, like we may be in the middle of like a re um, like, we're, we're not genetically designed, we haven't adapted to be able to do potentially a million people like so 
to think that I mean it's very possible I guess that we're like in the middle of some like great adaptation to like catch up with the times but I mean who knows how many million years that could potentially take <laughs> but like it's just so crazy to think of how far off of that number we're at now you know we live in 200,000 people populations like if again just a theory here but like if that was true and like that was really then just the act of being in a city of 200,000 people would be like the amount of unknown that you'd be constantly surrounded by would be extremely anxiety producing you know and like because you'd be so far away from what you're like design you have to constantly be on high alert you'd never know who was talking about you or whatever it would just be a com a very unsettling like world to live in yeah so anyway i'm not going anywhere with that but uh, it's neat to think that you know maybe um we are uh, historically humans lived in smaller groups and um now humans live in larger groups than ever before uh, and what is sort of the match and the mismatch there. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we didn't evolve in a landscape with cars and we can drive cars. We, um, so our minds can do pretty amazing things even if we didn't evolve specifically to do them. Um, but yeah, now there are some potentially uh, novel pressures like dealing with a whole bunch of people um, on social media. At the same time, I would I would bet that um, I mean maybe the number is even smaller for Gen what are they Gen Z the like teens today the kids that I'm just picturing the show Euphoria like, those kids yeah. Um, so yeah I I mean I know Dunbar has done some stuff uh, looking at um, sort of the looking at sociality even online and finding that it doesn't seem that different from what we'd expect in the real world. So maybe these are constraints, maybe they're not, mm -hmm. maybe they'll exist long into the future, maybe they won't. But even right now, I don't know if I could sit down with 150 people. Um, and yeah. I'm, I'm trying to do social media. Oh, good Lord, I hate it. Uh, this is where I should say that Eric J. Peterson at UC Boulder and Dan Conroy Beam at UC Santa Barbara, who are among my besties. Um, you were both right. I should not be on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's got to be the, of the social medias, the biggest dumpster fire of all of them. I mean, I try and just say nice things. I don't try and do like hot takes or anything. That's what Jesus and Mero are for. I'll, I'll watch them. I'll enjoy it. And I'll call yeah. it a day. Um, but, but just like the, the character constraints to what you can post, it's like designed for, I mean, I mean, really thinking back to like what the story of like how it was created, like there's no possible way they ever imagined it getting to the place that it is now. Like it was meant as a, because apparently cabbies in New York were like texting shorthand and they were like using like these really quick messages back and forth. So somebody who saw this communication technique between cabbies made it a social media of like the short burst, like, this is what's up. Like, this is where I'm going. Like, this is the, where the traffic's at, like all of these quick stuff. And then it became a social media to communicate with people. I mean, it shouldn't but, be an oxymoron, like academic Twitter, because what we do is supposed to be pretty nuanced and yet how can it be? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh man. Well, I, this has been awesome. Um, I really appreciate you sharing all this information, allowing Brennan and I to kind of just share our like unresearched thoughts yeah, um, and then have you reflect on them and provide share the some, nuance, some sound knowledge to our thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to play with ideas with you guys and tell uh, everybody, I guess, how much we don't know, which is you know, part of science. So yeah. 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 Thanks for thanks for the fun conversation. Um, this is this is awesome. I really could talk about this stuff all day, and so it's nice to actually talk about it all day with somebody that isn't myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah.